Hello guys and welcome to this Volks Wizard video. Now it probably didn't go unnoticed that the Mark 8 Golf R was released at the end of 2020, but you might have not noticed that at roughly the same time, Volkswagen also released two other brand new R models, the Tiguan R that you see here and the Touareg R. Now, unlike the Touareg R, the Tiguan R actually has got a lot in common with the Mark 8 Golf R. It's based on the same MQB platform. It's got the same 320 horsepower engine under the bonnet. And once you equalize the spec, it's only 9% more expensive. So it's quite possible you could be considering buying a Mark 8 Golf R or a Tiguan R. Could the Tiguan R actually be better than the Mark 8 Golf R? Well, we're gonna find out today by having a look at the outside of it, the inside of it, and of course, going for a very, very thorough test drive. But before we do that, let's have a look at the Tiguan R's on paper statistics. Okay, let's talk Tiguan. So this is Volkswagen's mid-size Golf-based SUV, joined the range in 2008, and it's been their third most popular seller after Golf and Polo. In 2016, the Mark II Tiguan came out, a completely new car based on the MQB platform. And in October 2020, the range was lightly revised. The changes are very subtle, both inside and outside, but we got a proper R model for the very first time. Up until then, it had just been R lines, which had looked good, but not really performed like an R. So yeah, it's quite a big deal, this car. You may think that the base price of this car at 17% more than the Golf 8R is quite expensive, but then when you equalize the spec, there's only 9% difference. So with the Tiguan R, you get 21 inch wheels, where it would cost you 825 pounds, to go from 18s to 19s on the Golf. You get heated seats as standard, that's 470 for the winter pack on the Golf. You get dynamic chassis control, that would cost you 785 pounds on the Golf. You get a rear view camera, that's 300 pounds extra on the Golf. You get a power tailgate on the Tiguan, you can't even spec that on the Golf. And you get the super funky seats with the cutout, which should have really fitted those to the Golf R, I think, so yeah. They are free. You can order leather seats, but they're more traditional seats. I spent all day in them yesterday, I think six hours worth of driving, and I came out of them aching less than when I got into the car. Now this car's got a few more extras on it, but not an awful lot. The lapis blue paint is £755, as it is on the Golf. The sunroof is actually £945. Now bearing in mind, it's a two panel sunroof, goes all the way to the back. It's got an electric blind. That's actually £55 cheaper than specking a sunroof on a Golf. Okay, looking at the um, performance then, it's quite a bit heavier than the Golf. It's a couple of hundred kilograms heavier, which means that the power to weight ratio is a bit less favorable. So the Golf's power to weight ratio, 206 horsepower to, per ton, that's pretty good. The Tiguan's is actually 184 brake horsepower per ton. So we'll see how that affects the car when we go driving. Obviously it's bigger, it's about 30 centimeters longer. It's not particularly much wider, about six, seven centimeters wider, excluding the mirrors. It's quite a lot taller though. So it's actually 21 centimeters taller. That's where your money goes then. And the wheelbase is actually only five centimeters bigger. So when we do the proper interior tour, I'll show you how much room there is in the back. It's not a particularly efficient car either, this Tiguan. It's got quite a high CO2 output of 226 grams per kilometre versus the Golf 178. That's massively different. And that's sort of reflected in the MPG, which is 28.3 miles per gallon as a WLTP combined. The Golf is 36 MPG. So quite a bit different considering they're the same engines on the same platform, but aerodynamics will pay, play a big part in that. Not to 60 time, well, 4.9 seconds for the Tiguan is pretty impressive. The Golf does it in 4.7 seconds, but bearing in mind this car is nearly 10% inferior in the power to weight ratio, it's no surprise that the Golf is beating the 4.7 quite a lot because it should be somewhere in the low fours if you take power to weight ratio as an indicator of its acceleration. Okay, that's the stats. Now let's go and have a look at the outside of the Tiguan R. Okay, I think we'll all agree that a Mark II Tiguan is a pretty good looking car and it doesn't get much better than when it's in lapis blue and our spec. And I think the 21 inch wheels that are standard also help, no doubt. 
it's actually reminding me of a Range Rover SVR. They do that in a bright blue colour and they've often got sort of light coloured sports seats with a cutout just like this car. But yeah, it's a pretty striking package. It's available in a few more colours than the Golf 8R. So you get pure white as standard. You can have lapis blue, as you see here, for £770. Or you can have dolphin grey for £635, deep black. Or my personal favourite, Reflex Silver. You can also have Oryx White Pearl Effect for £1,060. OK, let's have a closer look at the wheels then. So 21 inch Estorils with the R logo built into them. It's just a little sticker, so you should be able to refurb them uh, by sticking the new one on. They've got 255, 35, 21 Hankook, Coventus, S1, Evo, 3, SUV specific tyres. We've got the same brake setup from the Golf. So these are 357mm discs. They're two piece, so floating disc on an aluminium bell got blue calipers front and back with the R logo on them and they are the aluminium ones as per the Golf so they're 600 grams lighter than a steel caliper. Just have a look at the headlights because they're worth talking about. So the LED matrix are standard they're called the IQ light and to be honest I wouldn't drive a car now without LED matrix headlights they're so good especially with automatic main beam. The side of the Tiguan R is actually very similar to the normal R line and um, that's not a bad thing. You do get these matte aluminium mirror casings, that's the R trademark, silver roof rails, silver surround to the windows. Shame they can't really black all that out, maybe there'll be an option in time. You've got the R badge there going on the door going into the wing. We've got, I think, a slightly bigger spoiler here, but the rest of it is pretty standard the new R badge in the middle which I'm getting used to I think it looks pretty good even though it looks like a folded up paper clip there's a full width reflector down here which is interesting and there's a lot of gloss black by the way so there's no unpainted plastic on this car it's either body colored or gloss black we've got the four exhausts which are the R trademark interestingly they're not the thicker tipped version you get on the Mark 8 Golf R they're actually more like the 7.5 ones down here we've got independent rear suspension, we've got the little spoilers on the wishbones just like the Mark 8 Golf R and Club Sport. According to the press information there is also an additional um, aluminium subframe which I wish I could verify but I can't, that sounds pretty tricky if it's true. You can spec the Akrapovich exhaust for just over £3,000. Okay let's have a look inside the Tiguan R then. Now, I've never been a big fan of the plastic quality in the Mark II Tiguan, but you notice it less in the R because there are so many nice bits for your eyes to be drawn to instead. So we've got these carbon fibre effect inlays, we've got 30 colour ambient lighting in the doors, we've got Alcantara here, we've got padded leatherette armrest there, but it's not particularly well padded. All Tiguans get flop line door bins, they also unfortunately get all this hole here, which I think is a bit <laughs> nasty. I'm not a big fan of the footwell either because the carpet's quite cheap. There's a gap here which is very un Volkswagen, but we do get stainless steel pedals. We do get quite nice floor mats with a thick blue stripe and blue stitching and the R logo on a separate tab. We've got illuminated sill covers with the R logo which the Golf doesn't get, but both Tiguan and Golf R get the R logo beamed onto the ground by the puddle lights, which is a nice touch. My favourite touch though are the seats. Now they do look a bit like the ones in Golf 8 are the same side Begner cloth, same Art Velours bolsters. They might be a little less bolstered down here, but they seem very amply bolstered up here where it matters. And most importantly, they've got this cutout section which doesn't really do anything, just looks really cool. And I do wonder why they didn't put this in the Golf 8R to make the seats stand out from all the other models that are a lot cheaper that have got basically the same seats all the way from R line up to R. You couldn't fit these seats specifically because the base is bigger but I'm sure they could have fitted this backrest to the to the base of the Golf. There you go. Okay let's have a look at the user interface. Now it really is a mix of Mark 7.5 Golf or pre-faced with Tiguan and Mark 8 but you'll be glad to know it's largely the older car that dominates in here. 
So we've got a traditional headlight switch. We've got the old style infotainment screen with knobs. We've got a separate panel for climate control down here. So it's not been integrated into this screen. This is different to the pre facelift Mark II Tiguan because that had buttons on it, but this is just touch sensitive, but not haptic. There is no feedback from the panel at all. So sometimes you don't know if it's actually done what you've asked it to do. We do have the Mark 8 Golf R steering wheel in here looking completely unchanged. So we've got the big paddles. We've got the R button here, which lets you cycle the modes. So one light press and it'll go from mode to mode. But if you find yourself in individual and you really need to get to race without pressing three times, just press it more firmly. You'll hear two clicks and there it is straight into race. That's cool. Obviously, these are the haptic buttons that some people don't like, but they do get better with use. And it's got the heated steering wheel as well, as standard, as well as heated seats, which are down here. That's quite pleasant, isn't it? We have got a digital instrument cluster, digital cockpit pro. It's not as trick as the one in Golf 8R. So I think it's probably the old gen one. So it hasn't really got as much branding on it as the Golf 8 when it doesn't have its own R display with a horizontal rev counter. It just gets the odd R logo down the bottom if you press the right button, which is, I think, the same as 7.5 Golf R. It's got travel assist and adaptive cruise control as standard. A little tip on this car and Golf 8 as well. If you want to turn that off, there is a button you will never see unless you look that's on the end of that stalk there. And if you press that, you can get rid of lane assist really quickly. Um, you say, there you go, it's off. That's how quick it can be. Look, there's the R logo. So yeah, that's quite good. I don't think you can mess around with the assist system through this infotainment system because it's quite old fashioned. So it's not as integrated as the one in the, no, it's in Mark 8 Golf. So it's a little bit dated, but some people will prefer that. There are two USB-C ports in here now. So change from the traditional USB. So you'll need an adapter if you've got older cables like I have. It's got keyless entry and go, but I'm not sure if it can be disabled as easily as it can be on Golf 8. If you feel it's a bit of a security risk of Golf 8, you just do it through the infotainment screen. This is old school. It's not as well integrated into the car's electronics, so you might be stuck with it if you don't like it. It's okay in here. I think it's a bit cluttered compared to Golf 8. Some people will say it's more functional. Okay. I don't like the shifter. It's got the traditional shifter, which is quite chunky. And it doesn't look particularly nice to me. Plastic, sort of aluminium on there. I think this gate has got blue stitching, but it feels like a bin bag. It's really quite nasty. We've got a full complement of buttons down here then. So electric parking brake with auto hold, traction control on and off, which is quite handy. Because we'll need to do that when we go and try the launch control later. We've got the mode selector here, which you can do as well down here using this dial, he says. Um, it's also got these uh, off-road modes as well. So seven modes in total, I think three for off-road and four for the road. Parking sensors on and off. There's a rear view camera. It's got self-park as well, so it'll parallel park for you with that button there. If the engine's running, it's in reverse, and you can turn the start-stop system on and off with that. Two cup holders down there, and yeah, pretty standard fare down there. When I first drove a Mark II Tiguan, when you moved the shifter, the whole surround to it moved. But I think they've sorted that now. That feels pretty good. We don't have a line glove box, just like Golf 8. It's just scratchy plastic in there. Overall, I think it works pretty well. Let's now have a look at rear passenger space, because that's important in a car like this. It is apparently only five centimetres bigger in the wheelbase, which doesn't bode well, but let's see what it's really like. Now, it's definitely in my driving position because I drove this car for six hours yesterday and I'm six foot tall, by the way. So there we go. It's pretty good for knee room. In fact, this is a really nice car to sit in the back of. I sat in a few when I've been making these videos and none have been this good. It probably helps that we've got the panoramic glass sunroof, which, by the way, is still operated by traditional buttons, as are the switches the lights so it's not all new in here by any means but yeah it's pretty good these seats don't seem to obstruct much for rear passenger space so yeah it's good 
That's some temperature control down there, a USB-C there, and a 12 volt, and chrome tips on these down, which is pretty good. So yeah, this is a really nice place to be in. And if you want a reason to buy an SUV rather than a hatchback or an estate car, I'd say this is probably it. Right, let's have a look in the boot. Now you probably expect it to open with the badge, don't you? But you don't, you've got a little touch sensitive panel just there, and that triggers the power operation. So yeah, it's a pretty decent size. There is no spare wheel down there though, and it's not carpeted, which looks a bit odd. I think maybe that's new for the facelifts because the boot floor might've been a bit higher before. We've got 40, 20, 40 rear seats, so you can, and you can release them like this. Which is pretty good. The seats also move forward, so you can keep them upright, but move them forward, that increases the boot space a bit. So without doing that, this is a 520 litre boot. If you push the seats forward, you get 615 litres. If you fold them down, you get 1,655 litres. Now that sounds pretty good, but if you compare it to a Golf 8 Estate, not necessarily the R model, which might be you know, marginally less, it's pretty similar actually. Okay, you can't move the seats forward on the Golf Estate, but if you have these in the most rearward position, the Golf Estate is actually bigger in boot space. And if you fold them down, the Golf is only 35 litres smaller. So yeah, there's no real reason to buy an SUV when it comes to boot space compared to a Golf Estate, which is a lot smaller overall. I think it might be a bit longer, but it's really the width that makes these cars quite hard to manoeuvre. Right, let's have a quick look under the bonnet. Well, I'm pleased to report I've been pleasantly surprised by the fact it's got a telescopic strut. I wonder if it bolts onto my Golf. Hmm. Okay, under here, it's the familiar EA AAA Evo 4 engine. Got the same DNF engine code as the Golf R, so it is really just a Golf R engine plonked in there. Maybe the torque char characteristics are a little bit different, but it is 320 horsepower and 420 newton meters, seven speed DSG, and Haldex all wheel drive system with torque vectoring. So, yeah, it sounds pretty good on paper, but how does that relate to the way the car drives? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's go and drive the Tiguan R. Okay, let's start off then by talking about DCC, Dynamic Chassis Control, because it's free with the Tiguan R, and that's probably a very good thing because with 21 inch wheels and nearly two tons to keep in check, it needs all the help it can get. Now, unlike Golf 8, we don't have multi-adjustable DCC with 15 different positions. There are just the three fixed modes of comfort, sport, and race. There is no normal mode anymore, just like Mark 8 R. Sport is the default mode, and it starts up in that all the time. But you can switch it into comfort, and it's pretty compliant still not super plush little imperfections like this will sort of shudder through the cabin and then when you get to roundabout it's actually pretty ugh, awful if you've driven an SUV from about 10 years ago you'll know what I mean yeah there's quite a lot of squidge in the chassis more than you'd expect considering how the ride quality isn't an awful lot better so sport is pretty well judged And yeah, I think most people will just leave it in that mode all the time. There's a bit of fake sound, but it, it seems to ride not that differently to comfort mode. And when you get to corners like this, it feels good. Body control, yeah, is actually very impressive. Up to a point though, it's no Golf R this though. Let's put it into race mode and give it its best chance. So everything's hunkered down. There's a bit more fake noise. There's not an awful lot of real exhaust noise, by the way. You might want the Akrapovich. Now in these corners, you know, it feels great. It feels good, but it doesn't feel anything like as good as Golf AR. Now, that might be good or bad, depending which way you look at it, because it's quite exciting going not that fast around these corners because you're driving a two-ton SUV and it's taking a bit more concentration. The Golf R kind of drives itself. Yeah, and there are some kind of moments where the chassis does something that sort of scares you a bit, but it, it's really 
shouldn't be scared because it is very good. It's just not as good as a Golf R and that's a really good car. Now, performance-wise, well, we've got the same 320 horsepower, we've got 420 newton meters of the torque, just like the Golf R, but we weigh 200 kilograms more, and that's not to be ignored. Likewise, we've got the same brakes at 357 millimeters, but they're going to be doing a lot more work in this car with 200 kilograms more to deal with. So, whilst on paper it's a match for the Golf R, if you look at the weight, it's not. It's, it's a good sort of 5 to 10% inferior in everything, but that still makes this car hugely, hugely capable. I mean, you wouldn't really want any more performance than this. It's just ridiculous. The way it just headbutts the horizon. I guess I should at least talk about the fact that the Tiguan R's Haldex four-wheel drive system can do torque vectoring. So basically it can transmit up to 100% of the available torque to the outside rear wheel in the corners, which basically means that if it senses the understeer the car's pushing on, it will just shove torque to the outer rear wheel to, to stop the understeer, to basically create a little bit of oversteer. It's only gonna be a little dab just to correct the car. And before you know, it's done it, it's stopped doing it basically, it's not like a big drift and you know you kind of feel that this car's not as tied down as the Golf R so probably in the wet you may need it a bit more but I think in these kind of conditions 255 section tyres mean that enough grip. Okay well because I don't have a spare pair of pants in the car I'd probably rather demonstrate to you launch control than torque vectoring. So we've got ESC in its middle setting, we've got start stop off, we're in race mode. Uh, I think that's it, I've got my foot on the brake, my left foot, and I've got my right foot down on the gas. And now I'll put the speedo visible on the virtual cockpit. There we go, it's bang in the middle. So if you want to time it, do your best, right? So I'm gonna put my foot down on the throttle now. Launch control active, go! Now that's not as fast as a Golf, I can even tell that from here, but it's a lot more exciting because the car almost feels like it's going to do a wheelie, there's definitely a sensation of it going back on its rear wheels, it's brilliant. Okay, let's also try the stationary rev thing because... The Golf R did it, you could rev it through, there's no soft limiter, and I was just curious to know if they've kind of forgotten a bit of fun with this car or not. So we're in neutral. I'll give you the display on here. No, it revs right through. So that's that's pretty cool that you know you can do it in the golf you can do it in the tiguan i only wish it sounded a little bit better now i've never been a big fan of suvs and that hasn't changed today yes you get the higher driving position and a bit more space but you do pay for that in terms of handling and efficiency but clearly the typical car buyer does not care about those things because SUVs are selling like hot cakes. So for me to give this car a fair review, I need to look at it from the perspective of the typical SUV buyer. And if you do that, it makes a lot more sense. It's only 9% more expensive than the equivalent spec Golf R, but for that you get a much bigger car. You get a lot more space for rear passengers, which is really important if you're carrying children, but I think most importantly for a lot of people, whether they'll admit this or not, is that for the extra 9% over the Golf, you get a car that actually looks at least 20% more expensive than the Golf R. And I think for a lot of buyers, that does mean a lot because it will impress friends, relatives, colleagues, neighbors, a lot more than a Golf, even a Golf R. 
Anyway, guys, thank you for watching this Volks Wizard video. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Please do comment. Please do share. As ever, please do subscribe. And I'll see you for the next one very soon.